Sometimes the two armies would send to the arena their bravest men. It was on such an occasion an Mtetwa general ordered, let the bravest in your army face our bravest man. His candidate was a fierce looking man with muscles of iron. Many feared him, trusting only to their feet. No sooner had the general spoken than he began to move, flexing his muscles and bending his legs like a gigantic tree. He groaned like a bull that had recently been stung by wasps. From the opposing side came the dweller of the round mountains, the clash of weapons, the writhing of muscles, the swiveling of movement of arms, the thundering of feet, the challenging ram, the clash of heads like two bounding boulders. The spectators stood entranced by the spectacle. The wild cry of surrender, the eagle. The tears of the rabbit, crestfallen and defeated, they turned back, singing in discord. It was such half-hearted battles that incensed Shaka. He uttered doctrines never heard in Mtetwa land before. How many times have we gone to battle and returned without victory? We conquer, and yet we come back like the vanquished. The defeated re-emerge again and again. They launch new wars. Like the menace of weeds in a fertile field they are. The weapons we carry are long spears of fragile wood. Each one who can carve, carves his own weapon. Many return empty-handed, having exhausted their supplies of iron. Yet victory must be final. The enemy must be chased and trapped in his own home. Then he shall not raise his head again. As he said these words, many listened silently, doubting the wisdom of these new ideas and claiming this strategy was an open gate to bloodshed. Was it not true, they asked? The king's fame lay in his kindliness? Was it not this that won him many hearts? Surely, they reasoned, war is for subjugation, not for destruction. Such outrageous assaults against a victim might build allies who might rally to his support, eager to stem the tide of bitterness and vowing the destroyer should himself be destroyed. As generals and regiments argued, puzzled by these ideas, Shaka stood up and picked up a long spear from General Buza's feet. He broke it into pieces like a light reed and said, How can anyone fight with this thin, marrowed piece of wood? How can such feeble twigs support empires and kingdoms? Some began to see his persuasive logic. He continued, I ask of you, great general, Give me consent to mold my own weapons, to shape my shield with which to parry my enemies. When I have completed these tasks, grant that I fight alone a body of men. Let them throw their spears at me at will. From every side came applause of this imagined battle. Ngawazi, who trusted him, stood up and said, Brother of the battlefield, we shall be together in that battle. When Shaka was granted his wish, he set out to the Mbonami clans, the makers of the intricate iron. He told the amazed listeners his own ideas. I want a spear, made short and of the toughest wood. Even as I stab the trunk of a tree, let it remain firm. I shall pay for such a spear with my choicest beasts. As he spoke, he pointed to his cattle in the cattle fold. Their flesh trembled with fatness. The Mbonambi experts consented, but deride these new ideas, knowing how many believe victory comes from shape of weapons. On the second day, the spear maker summoned him. Young man of Zululand, your weapon is ready. But one question obsesses me. How will you use such a spear for missile battles? Shaka smiled and said, Father, I shall not throw my precious spear. I shall come close to the man and hug him with my weapons.
The old man shook his head, puzzled at these ideas. He said, take your gifts of beasts. Give me only from those of your future triumphs. It seems I shall die at the beginning of an era. I give you my blessing, child of Nguni land. Let it be your fate to conquer, but never forget those who prophesied your greatness. Shaka departed, his mind in turmoil. Sensing a generous blessing of the forefathers, he ran his hand over his weapon, caressing the shaft and its blade with his long fingers. Often he laughed loud, as though seized by some <laughs> madness. As he reached his age mates of the Ezekwe regiment, a young fighter ran forward, declaiming his poems. It was as though he sensed the fires of war in him. Shaka said, restraining him, I am grateful to you for these words, Santongela. Examining his spear, testing its thrust, and shaking it in all directions, Shaka commented, From this weapon shall come a plan that shall be the parent of all my strategies. With my black shield, I shall cover and hook the enemies, taking them with my shadow into their night. By my sister, I swear I shall finish them. They looked at each other, still confused at these words. He called aside Nkwaboka and demonstrated on him his device. He hooked him and swiveled him around with his shield. Then he laughed <laughs> as if he had discovered a secret. He said, tomorrow, I need someone who can run, who, with an antelope speed, can cross the whole field. Should he outrun me, he shall take all my cattle. They accepted this, thinking it only a young man's frivolous joke. Next day at dawn, the fleet-footed young men stood boasting, waiting at the end of a long stretch of land. Then suddenly, like two bodies of the wind rushing from the south, like two antelopes startled by a pack of howling dogs, dust rose from their feet, spinning high like wings of clouds. Shaka speeded past a clump of dense foliage, his feet thundering like a stampede of giraffes. Until in one loud triumphal cry, he reached the regimental grounds. It was then they realized he had discarded his impeding sandals. He threw himself on the ground, laughing triumphantly until his laughter made others laugh. It was as if his very lungs flapped against his ribs. He laughed until tears rolled down his face. Catching his breath, he said, I held the tale of the whirlwinds. All hail, children of the king, great voice of ancestral spirits. I hold the hair of the wind. I hold the men. The roots are torn out of the high mountain. Many who listened were baffled by these garbled words, but he kept their secret and their truth in his heart. Addressing his regimental assembly, he said things that puzzled even the masters of war strategy. I ask you to listen to me carefully. I have discovered an unbeatable plan against our enemies. I repeat, the essence of success in war is speed. Speed is of the mind and all intricacies of war. Speed is of those who meticulously examine the war's arena who combine their wisdom with the wisdom of the wiser men. Through this knowledge, the enemy is surrounded. Speed is of the feet, not encumbered by sandals. Speed is embedded in the shape of my spear. By this, our heroes shall reap the enemy in close combat. As the enemy dissipates its power and throws all its missiles, we shall break through their lines turning our clouds of shields into a forest of weapons. We shall rip their naked chest at close quarters. If we follow this strategy, no enemy shall defeat us, for all wars are the same, following only laws of battle. As he spoke, 
His eyes caught every face in the crowd, as if from each word he had hoped for an ecstatic applause. Nor could he sit in one place. His very intestines seemed tied in knots. Many gestured as though to talk, but only looked at each other. Had Shaka not been the favorite hero of his equal regiment, they might have summoned the doctors of war to heal him of the fierce power that a man inherits from battle. It was Buza, the great general of Ezekiel, who spoke. Shaka, the mountains of the world seem to constantly call your name. Each day you bring us ever new ideas. Perhaps it is not our age that shall inherit your wisdom, but a future generation which shall better penetrate your visions. Even though some may see madness in your plans, I always discover in them a new wisdom beyond our times. Yet it would be more laudable if they came in limited amounts, for people prefer to be persuaded slowly about their customs. Shaka leapt up and spoke angrily. General, I have always hated the shackles of custom, for after all, in human affairs, there are no eternal laws. Each generation makes a consensus of its own laws. They do not bind forever those still to be born. Those who feast on the grounds of others often are forced into gestures of friendship they do not desire. But we are the generation that cannot be bypassed. We shall not be blinded by gifts from feasts. We are our own fire. We shall stand above the mountains as the sun. Shaka was alarmed at the violence of his own voice. He sat down, his voice contorted with rage. Someone near him nudged him with an elbow, trying to restrain him from his haughty dialogue. But Shaka turned his eyes in fury and was about to speak when he saw the general looking at him. Shaka knew no one succeeds in a blind clash with leadership. Buza said to him, I acclaim the penetrating truth of your words. Your visions gallop ahead of our thoughts. With permission of the assembly, I shall put these views before the king. The gathering dispersed at once. Shaka, still in a dark mood, set off in his own solitary direction. He reached a lone spot where he often sat meditating. He walked a few paces till he could see a little hill here he halted, guessing out passages and escape points of the hill. At each route, he posted imaginary troops. Some he commanded to move from around the hill. Some he commanded to close the gap of the threatening troops. So overcome with this victory, he sang a new song. Thus was born the great war hymn of the Fasimba Regiment. He walked over the hill, humming this song. He saw new exits at the sheer sides of the hill. Through an error of judgment, many would have lost their lives. Like this, he continued, fighting his battles of fantasy. Until the late day cycle, he walked home slowly, still engrossed with his thoughts. Ele se comece